going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to our presentation today, The Ecology of Englewood, Then, Now, and Into the Future. We're doing this for the Lemon Bay Fest. And I am Dr. Katherine Clements. I'm the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator at University of Florida IFAS Extension, Sarasota County. So I do a lot of educational programming that's focused on native and invasive plants and wildlife and conservation education. Those are my main focuses. And some of the programs that I do include the Florida Master Naturalist Program, which is a University of Florida environmental education program for adults. The Life Program, which is for elementary kids, third through fifth grade, and lots of other nature-based programs for all ages. I have a bachelor's of science degree from Buffalo, New York in, in environmental studies. And I spent about 15 years as a physician before I decided to come full circle and come back to environmental education about four years ago with my position here at uh, University of Florida IFAS Extension. So University of Florida IFAS Extension, if you don't know what it is, we are a partnership between Sarasota County, the University of Florida, and the USDA. And there's actually a county extension office in every county in the state of Florida and also in all states in our country. And our mission is really to provide education, resources, and solutions for our communities based on the research done at the University of Florida. And our office here in Sarasota County is out on Clark Road, just a little east of I-75. Uh, so we're a great place to come to or during COVID, give us a call or email us if you need assistance with any of these areas that you see on the screen. These are all our program areas. And these are some of the programs that we do through our office up there in the upper right hand corner is that Master Naturalist logo that I facilitate. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to spend about 45 minutes, uh, maybe a little bit longer if there ends up being a number of questions. And we're going to talk about the history of Englewood and Lemon Bay through an ecological lens. So really looking at this history through the lens of the environment. We're going to talk about land use changes and impacts over the years. And then we're going to watch a video on the county preserves and natural areas that you can visit near the Englewood area. And towards the end, we're gonna talk about land acquisition for conservation and what we can all do now to make sure there is land available for generations to come. Uh, during the presentation, please feel free to type any questions you have into the chat box. If I can, I'll answer them during the presentation, but more than likely we'll hold them and answer them to the end, at which time you could also unmute as well and we can have a conversation. So I pulled this image from Google Earth just yesterday, and these are some of the areas I'm going to highlight in our conversation today. So here at the very bottom of this picture, of course, is the Gulf of Mexico, and we have the Barrier Island, and then we have Lemon Bay, and Englewood is this populated area right here. And we're gonna go through some of these areas, especially South Venice, Lemon Bay, Minnesota Scrub and Lemon Bay Park down here to the south. So let's talk a little bit about the beginnings of Englewood, Florida. In the 1890s, three brothers from Englewood, Illinois actually followed their lemon growing, scurvy treating dream to the southwest Florida coast to an area just north of Grove City. They purchased 2,000 acres and the original plat for Englewood was recorded in 1896. Attempting to make their fortune selling lemons and land on which to grow lemons, they called their newfound Florida home Englewood and the water to the west, Lemon Bay. Some sources say Lemon Bay was named after the lemons and some suggest that it was named after lemon sharks that inhabited the bay. Sadly, after the cold winters of 1894 and 1895, the lemon trees that these brothers had planted died. But dreamers that they were, Herbert Howard and Ira Nichols, next attempted to make their fortune on tourism, constructing the Englewood Inn on Perry Street and a general store on Yale Street, and promoting Englewood as a mecca for hunting, fishing, and water sports. 
Englewood perhaps became one of Florida's earliest tourist towns. But bad luck struck again when the Englewood Inn burned in 1909. So Sarasota County was actually established in 1921. So this is Sarasota County's centennial. Happy birthday to Sarasota County. It is our 60th county out of 67. And then Englewood was incorporated in 1925 after its early beginnings with the Nichols brothers. Fishing, clamming, lumber, and tourism have been important economic factors over the years. And if you were one of the first to come to Lemon Bay in the early 1900s, you might have started your morning with a beautiful sunrise on pristine beaches with windswept dune systems covered in sea oats and sea grape and inner tidal swales supporting shorebirds and sea turtles. On much of the coast in the barrier islands, you would have found tangles of mangrove forest and estuaries teeming with the promise of new life. Moving inland, you might encounter freshwater sloughs full of wading birds searching for their breakfast. And pine flatwoods, an incredibly diverse ecosystem where native plants fill the understory. I apologize for my dogs. And eventually you might wander into scrub habitat, home to many endemic species found only in Florida, many of which are now considered endangered. Ending your day with a sunset in the scrubby flatwoods, an owl calls to its mate, heralding the beginning of the night. So that's what you might have first encountered as a pioneer in the early 1900s coming to Englewood and Lemon Bay. But you also would have encountered a thick understory or undergrowth of these mangroves, uh, barrier islands that often were impassable to larger boats and ships. So as more people came to our beautiful coastline, they were forced to sail into those deeper and rougher waters of the Gulf to travel into our three main bays like Big Sarasota Bay, Little Sarasota Bay, and Lemon Bay. Each of these bays was separated by natural barriers. In fact, a five mile land barrier existed from Roberts Bay just below Casey Key to Alligator Creek at the north of Lemon Bay. Lemon Bay is a 16 mile long embayment from Alligator Creek to the Bosilla Pass area south of Grove City. It ranged from 200 feet to one mile wide and depths were anywhere from half a feet to 15 feet. Both the northern and southern portions of the bay were quite shallow, making passage difficult. So this is the story of Lemon Bay before changes were made by the US Army Corps of Engineers, navigation improvements as the main goal of those changes. And here on your slide, you see the dredge Charleston. So dredging of the intercoastal waterway began in the 1890s and ended in 1967. It created these channels that allowed a passage for goods, services, and people. But we're gonna talk about how it dramatically changed the landscape, especially where spoil material or the material that was dredged to create the intercoastal was dumped. Dredging damaged seagrass beds, mangroves, shellfish, wildlife estuaries, and archeologically important sites. It altered tidal flow and impacted critical habitat. According to the US Coast and Geodetic Survey, sorry, and the Southwest Florida Water Management District, there has been a 92% decrease in salt marsh a 26% decrease in mangroves in Sarasota Bay from the 1890s to the 1990s, and other sources estimate a 90% loss of scrub habitat in Sarasota County. So many of these changes occurred over these last hundred years, but especially during those times of dredging. 
And this is just an indication of the area that was dredged around Lemon Bay to create a nine foot deep and 10 foot wide channel. And this entire channel, the intercoastal waterways runs from Tampa Bay to Charlotte Harbor. As I mentioned, it started in 189 and was completed in 1967, but most of what happened around the Lemon Bay area was done in those last years in the 1960s. And this is just a, a diagram that shows the changes in depth on the left-hand side is 1890 and on the right hand side is 1990. So you see a dramatic change in, uh, in depth of water and that is gonna change tides. It's gonna change those coastal communities, uh, plant communities like seagrass beds and the mangroves. Here also your further left image is 1890 and your right image is 1990. These drawings indicate changes in land use over those hundred years. So on the left hand side you see a lot of different shades of green and those are mangroves and shrub and rangeland areas as well as upland forest. Um, in this case upland forest might be something like a hardwood hammock where you would have um, oaks or saw palmetto or something like that. Um, and then in your right hand image, you see a lot of that green has disappeared as well as you see changes in the shape of the waterway and you see a lot of gray and gray refers to urban developed areas. So of course we all know that things have changed dramatically in a hundred years of our history, uh, but images like this really drive that home in terms of the differences. So I'm going to show you a few historical photos. These are all from a historical geography of Southwest Florida waterways by the authors that you see there on your screen. This, is, uh, this document is available online if you want to look at it. It's a very long document, but it is very interesting to read. I'm going to show you some of these dredging photos. So this is a dredge and spoil site near Alligator Creek in Lemon Bay in 1965. So right here where you see the letter A, this is actually the dredge. So um, we're seeing an aerial view and look how small that dredge is compared to these areas marked B uh, that are where the spoil or the material that was being dredged up were then dumped. And you can see native habitat surrounding that and you can see the stark contrast. Here's our barrier island of Minnesota uh, key right above here. Um, we're also starting to see a distinct channelization right here that wouldn't have naturally been occurring. And we're going to see um, today in a number of our slides and in a video that I'm going to show, we're really going to still be able to see these particular um, places where the spoil was dumped that are now in South Venice Lemon Bay Preserve. Here's another picture. Here's the dredge up here, labeled A. This is the pipeline um, that is taking the, the stuff that is being dredged over here. They have put in, uh, they have put in this natural barrier of dredge material as a containment wall. And then they are continuing to fill this in with the dredging material, as you can see in these areas here. Um, this is a really interesting picture. Um, actually, this is the picture on your left is sort of flipped. So this is Leach's Key right here. And in this picture, it's over here. Um, this is Minnesota. Um, this is Minnesota Key, and that's it here. So you can see the orientation of the two pictures is sort of off from each other. Uh, they're sort of orientated backwards. But what you're seeing here on the left is you're seeing the area around Leach's Key. Uh, when it's still in its natural state. And this is probably a lot of mangrove on the key. This was probably potentially a bird rookery where birds could nest and have their young. Uh, right in here between both of the, the smaller sort of leeches key island and then the barrier island, there's probably, this looks to be a lot of seagrass beds. And what's happened here in the photo on the right is they've actually filled that whole area with uh, dredging material with the spoil. Here's another um, picture indicating the dredging and landfill around Tom Adams Bridge so that the bridge could be built. So history ain't always sweet. 
Um, people in land use have shaped the ecology of areas over time, unless the area is a pristine preservation site, which really we don't have a lot of those left pretty much in our whole world currently. Um, so preservation means that it's being preserved in its completely natural state, which means we would limit or not allow human interaction with that land at all. And that's not really likely in this day and age. Um, so people and land have this interaction. And when we talk about ecological history, we're very much talking about cultural history, the peoples of that land and their interaction with that land. And we want to ask questions like, how was the land used? And how has the land then changed? So just like we saw as we start to talk through this story of the dredging of the intercoastal waterway so that people could more easily be transported here and goods and services could be transported without the need to go into those rougher waters of the Gulf, this dramatically changed the land, not only how it was used, but also the ecology of the land in our Sarasota area, but definitely in Englewood and Lemon Bay. So now when we look back over that time and we want to try to bring some of those natural areas back to perhaps their more natural state, how do we do that? How do we go through this process called restoration? Well, most land managers will attempt restoration through a historical lens. That means they're gonna refer back to some of the earliest images they may have of the land prior to land use changes. They will look at aerials. Um, in Sarasota County, we have aerial photos available back to 1948, but there also may be other photos. There might be postcards, there might be folk songs. Uh, really, we can look at anything that provides a context for that area in order to do ecological restoration. Although I would say that restoration is a misnomer. Efforts can never really fully restore a mangrove forest or a seasonal wetland or scrub habitat. But we may come close enough to provide healthy habitat for the plants and animals that make Florida their home. There are many challenges along the process of restoration such as limited resources, people, time, money, and other resources are all limited. For instance, in Sarasota County, their natural areas and trails staff is 22 people, and those employees manage 66,000 acres of natural areas. So that's quite a big job. And of course, they contract some of their management and restoration efforts out but there's always limits. There's never gonna be enough people, time, money, or resources to restore some of the damage that's been done to our natural areas. So restoration, it's not all just puppies and rainbows. So we're gonna watch a video in a moment of some of the natural areas in, in Sarasota County around the Englewood area. I wanted to be able to take you guys on a virtual tour of these areas because here we are on Zoom together and we can't just go for a walk together, which is one of my favorite things to do, is to go out in nature and really bring people to the land and educate them about the land and some of these concerns and connect them with that feeling of nature and the hopes for conservation. This is a 1948 aerial uh, from the Englewood area. So I'm orientate you a little bit. Here's our Minnesota Key barrier island here. These are pieced together. So that's why you see some uh, lines and differences. These are all pieced together from separate aerials in the 1948 timeframe. Uh, Englewood is right here. You can see, because I'm gonna show you some current photos in a minute, but take a look right here at how few roads there were um, how few little tiny houses you can actually see. Uh, Lemon Bay Park, sorry, Lemon Bay Park is down here. And South Venice, oh, sorry, Lemon Bay Park is here. South Venice Lemon Bay Preserve that we're going to talk about in a minute is up here, as well as Minnesota Scrub Preserve, which is over here. Um, here to the east, uh, you're going to see all of these little black dots. This is what currently, a lot of this is Mayaka State Forest. So this is conservation land and you're gonna see in the upcoming aerials that 
This remains somewhat the same because it has been conserved since prior to this time. Uh, and all of those little black dots are actual natural wetlands, depression marshes, that many of them still exist, even though the hydrology has changed um, of our area. And some of these wetlands, even the ones in conservation areas, we are losing because of the changes in uh, the water table. So 1948, and here's 2019. So once again, you can see the Mayaka State Forest area. It's not quite, and the, the scale isn't exactly the same, but it's close enough. You can still see a lot of those wetlands, but I'm not seeing quite as many. Uh, what is considered Englewood is outlined in red here. And up here is South Venice Lemon Bay Preserve, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I believe, yep, here's Lemon Bay Park right here. Oh yes, and here I've given you a slide. These are the three areas we're gonna go and visit in the video. So the video is 18 minutes long. Hi, I'm Dr. Katherine Clements, the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator for University of Florida IFAS Sarasota County Extension. And we are here today at Manasota Scrub Preserve, one of our amazing Sarasota County preserves. And we're gonna go meet my friend, Dr. Abby Turna to see a little bit more. Let's go find her. Hi, I'm Dr. Abby Turna. I'm a water resources extension agent at University of Florida IFAS Extension in Sarasota County. I'm also a wetland scientist. Reason one for why I love coming to Manasota Scrub Preserve so many wetlands, specifically depression marshes that you have access to. Reason number two for why I love coming here, this Willowhead Swamp, located at Trail Marker 8 at Minnesota Scrub Preserve. Reason number three for why I love coming here, as you're walking along the trail, you'll see these very small changes in elevation. Just a couple inches is enough for these areas to get filled with water during the wet season, which occurs June through September. Reason four, there's a rich variety of Florida native wetland plants, like hat pins. Welcome to Lemon Bay Park. My name is Natalie Smith and I'm a parks naturalist here with Sarasota County Parks Recreation and Natural Resources. And we are here today to share, share some information with you about some mangrove species we find around Lemon Bay. And this park in particular is 210 acres um, a preserved natural area. Within this park, we have eight natural communities, one of which are mangrove forests. And so historically, perhaps 100 years ago, if you were to come out to Lemon Bay, it would have been surrounded by mangrove forest. Today, because of development and habitat loss, we've lost a lot of that really important mangrove shoreline that serves so many important functions. And Lemon Bay Park in particular has the longest remaining continuous stretch of mangroves left within Sarasota County. So when we talk about mangroves, we're talking about salt tolerant plants that um, are usually either shrubs or trees, and they serve a variety of really important functions. They're actually one of the most productive ecosystems in Florida, and they also help us in a variety of ways. They help protect us against storm surge, they help stabilize the coast, and they are tremendous habitat for a variety of wildlife species, birds, it's a great resource for fisheries. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna head on out and we're gonna see if we can find three of our mangrove species. All right, so we've walked down the trail a little bit. And we've actually found all three mangrove species that you'd expect to find if you're out around Lemon Bay, kayaking, taking a walk or a hike. We found all three of them in one location. So this is gonna be really cool. Now, Mangroves, because of where they live, they've had to develop these adaptations that allow them to live in these really salty or brackish waters. So one way that they've kind of evolved and adapted to deal with the salt are in their root systems. And then they also have some adaptations that they've 
developed in their leaves. So we found right over here, a leaf of each of the three species. Now, when we're talking about the three different species, we're gonna talk about either a white mangrove, a red mangrove, or a black mangrove. So this first leaf we have right here, it has more of an oval shape. This is a white mangrove. And the best way I've found to identify white mangrove leaves is that if you look at the very tip of the leaf, there's a small indention. Also, if you come down to the base of the leaf, there are these two little glands that you can see, and those are called nectarine glands, and those produce almost kind of a nectar um, that the mangrove will use. Also, and this is harder to see, so if you're ever out here and you find a white mangrove leaf, I would recommend picking it up and holding it up against the sunlight because white mangroves have a really neat adaptation in that they have salt excreting glands kind of between the midrib and the outer edge of the leaf that run right down the center of each side. So that's a neat adaptation that white mangroves have used to deal with the salt water they live in. Now moving over here, this leaf is usually a little bit thicker and it's usually pretty uniform in color on the front and the back side of the leaf. Sometimes people say these have almost a blunted end on the leaf tip, but this is an example of a red mangrove leaf. And then finally, this is a black mangrove leaf. So for me, the easiest way to tell the difference when I'm looking at a, back, a black mangrove leaf is that the top is darker, and then when you flip it over, you have a whiter or kind of a lighter colored underside to that leaf. All right, so we just took a look at the three leaves of our three mangrove species, but now let's move over here and take a look at some of these really cool root systems that these trees have um, kind of evolved and used and adapted over time. So the first one and probably the most recognizable root are these big aerial prop roots that you'll see that are produced by red mangroves. And if you look out at the water, you can see that there's so much going on. You have roots above the water, you have roots below the water. So that just shows you how important they are in terms of habitat. Under the water, a lot of invertebrates use those, the fish use them, and they just provide so much structure and, and really neat hiding places for lots of wildlife to utilize. Now, down here in Florida, a lot of people refer to these as dead man's fingers. And these are pneumatophores. Really, these are kind of like a breathing tube that black mangroves have used or kind of evolved to use that help with atmospheric gas exchange. So in these conditions, if they were completely under the soil, under the water, it would be really difficult for this tree to exchange gases. So this is kind of a neat, a neat feature that they've evolved and developed. All right, now finally, kind of heading back to talking about the red mangrove. This is a propagule. Propagules are basically the seed of the red mangrove. And if you've been out in a kayak or if you've been out on a beach, you may have seen these. And they're just really kind of cool torpedo shaped structures that will float through the water until they reach the substrate or the ground. At that point, and if you look down here, you can see all of them that are sprouting and they're creating new trees. So these are bed, uh, baby red mangroves that are sprouting right there. Thank you for joining us for this tour of Lemon Bay Park. Be sure to come out and check us out. We have a kayak launch here. We have a butterfly garden. We also have about six and a half miles of trail you can explore. There's several pairs of resident bald eagles that come back to nest every year. Lots of gopher tortoises that you can see munching on grass along the trails. And of course, if you come out, See if you, can, if you can find the mangrove forest and if you can identify the three species of mangroves we've talked about today. Hello, I'm Diana Donahue and I work for Sarasota County as an environmental specialist with Parks, Recreation, and Natural Resources. I'm the manager of South Venice Lemon Bay, which is where I'm standing. It is a 230-acre preserve that is situated alongside Lemon Bay. It is, uh, contains six natural habitats, 
along with 25 acres of spoil material from dredging. The spoil is the dredge deposits from the dredging of the intercoastal. Dredging began in the 1890s and ended in 1967. The intercoastal waterway fulfilled a need of the residents to have a safe passage for boats to transport goods, services, and people. It was a huge economic benefit, but it came at an ecological cost that has still not been repaid to this day. The dredging in the northwest corner removed approximately 400 feet of shallow grass flats and mangrove forest, creating a channel at a depth of approximately 8 feet. The dredge material was then deposited over scrubby and mesic flatwoods along the coastline. Dredge material is a mix of sediment composed of rock, crushed shell material, and sand. It has a high salinity content, a reduction in nutrients as compared to the adjacent upland soils, and drains poorly. In addition, the depth to the water table is increased in these areas. Because of these characteristics, most of the plants naturally found in the habitats that were covered by the spoil do not fare well in this substrate. Even after several decades, the evidence of spoil placement is easily identified, as seen here looking at the large cabbage palms that appear to be stunted in height but are very thick indicating maturity. The vegetation coverage is also very sparse. Invasive exotic plants are often found in the spoil area, thereby providing a seed source that may be, be dispersed onto the adjacent natural habitats. Not only does the addition of the spoil affect the plant composition, but also the wildlife. There are some such as the gopher tortoise that can take advantage of the increased depth to the water table by digging their burrows into the spoil. But there are more animals that find little in the way of cover and food. This area would have been scrub or scrubby flatwoods as indicated by the adjoining community. Florida scrub jays, a threatened species, reside in the adjacent scrubby flatwoods but are not seen in the spoil area. They require scrub oaks for acorns, a main component of their diet. There are no scrub oaks found in this spoil area. It would be co very costly to restore this back to scrubby flatwoods. It would take a commitment of time, resources, and money. If we had that commitment, the steps would be to determine the appropriate original habitat using historic aerials and historic accounts, removing the spoil material down to the natural soils, locate a disposal site for the spoil, and replant the appropriate native plants associated with the original habitat. We would then have to survey for invasive exotic plants and treat as needed. If the three commitments are not aligned, it is important to keep the exotic plants from establishing and continue to focus on the health of the intact habitats by using the tools of mechanical treatment and prescribed fire. We are at South Venice Lemon Bay Preserve in a different area and I'm gonna talk about fire. For thousands of years, fire has shaped this landscape and the plants and animals that make Florida their home. So let's talk about prescribed fire. Why, you might ask, would someone want to burn an area of our beautiful Sarasota County preserves? Well, it's because prescribed fire is hands down the number one management tool for our natural areas. Prescribed fire is like a prescription for the forest. What? No, really, it is. There are so many benefits to our natural areas of prescribed fire. Some of our trees and plants don't even release their seeds without the heat of the fire. And then some of those seeds don't even start to grow unless they have that same heat. Also, fire is really important for biodiversity it helps to maintain a good number of species in our natural areas. And it helps to return necessary nutrients to the soil. Also, the animals that live here have adapted over those thousands of years to live in these fire dependent communities. And if we didn't have fire, the gopher tortoises wouldn't have empty sandy soil to dig their burrows they wouldn't have the native grasses that they so need to eat. 
the scrub jays wouldn't have a place to bury their acorns and the tall trees would start to move into the short scrubby oak areas and then predators like hawks and owls would be able to perch on those numerous trees and eat our scrub jays. So prescribed fire has all of these benefits, not only for our natural areas, but prescribed fire is really important for us humans too. How? Well, because prescribed fire helps to manage the amount of fuel load on the ground or the amount of burnable material. So if there was a lightning strike out here, if there has been a prescribed burn, there will be less fuel on the ground. And if there is a wildfire, it'll be easier and safer to be able to put out before it damages the natural areas or your homes. So let's take a look at a few different management areas here at South Venice Lemon Bay Preserve. So Sarasota County often does pretreatment to areas that we're going to burn, we mow. And some people might ask, well, if you're mowing, why would you then follow that up with fire? Well, let me tell you, show you why we would follow that up. As you can see here, it's mowed to a nice lower height, but the vegetation is still on the ground and I don't see any openings for areas that the scrub jays might cache their acorns. For that reason, we would need to burn, which also creates new nutrients for healthier plants, which also mean healthier acorns, which also benefits the scrub jays. We walked over to the other side of this corner. There's an area that was burned in the middle of 2020. Let's compare that. This area was burned in the middle of 2020 and it was mowed at the very same time the other section was that I just previously showed you. But with burning, the dry vegetation was burned off, creating these open sandy spots that you can see. And also, as I mentioned, with uh, the renutrifying of the soils, we've got some really good lush, low vegetation growing here as well. So comparing the mode not burned, we have a high thicket of uh, dry vegetation, whereas with burning, we do not have that. And it's much, much better for wildlife. Everybody can get through it, go for tortoises, and the scrub jays really love it. After the burn, we did have some visitors that expressed a little concern for the plants. They wondered if these plants were going to be able to survive the fire, if they'll grow back. It does sometimes look a little blackened and charred, but I can assure you that it does. As a matter of fact, we can compare this side that was burnt in 2020 to the other side that was burnt in 2019. It's only a year apart and look at the growth. It's actually at a perfect height. Scrub jays like to have scrub shrubs that are from three to six feet, although they can handle a little taller, but this is their preference. And uh, with a scrub that is a little bit taller, we'll get nice acorns that they'll be able to harvest. So I hope you take the time to come out to see South Venice Lemon Bay, walk the trails, go through the scrub, and you may even see a scrub jay. We also have eagles nesting here. Hope to see you soon. So I wanted you just to have a sense of the different uh, natural areas here around our Englewood area. 
and also really see that spoil site in South Venice Lemon Bay. So here's a map of South Venice Lemon Bay and here are the trails. We were actually up in this corner here and you can see clearly that the spoil still has impacted the ecosystems in this area. So the spoil sites are here and here. Those are those same spoil sites that we saw in the black and white photo from the 1960s right at the very beginning. Might be a problem, let me try one more time. The wonders of Zoom. Here we go. So sorry about that. So here's the map that I was just mentioning of South Venice Lemon uh, Bay Preserve. Uh, up here is the area that is still considerably impacted by the spoil area. And look at the channelization of the intercoastal waterway. That does not look natural at all because it is not. There is the channel that was dredged out. Um, which is a wonderful thing for us boaters and for tourists, but definitely has impacted our environment. So I've got just about five minutes left. There's a close-up photo of me standing in the spoil area. It basically looks like a moonscape out there in some of those areas. Um, it does not look like our natural habitat at all. So I want to end on a positive note uh, because, of course, human use is going to impact our environment. And yes, restoration is difficult, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't attempt restoration and conservation efforts because this is what's going to help save these natural areas for generations to come. So Bree Anderson is our Land Acquisition Coordinator for Sarasota County Parks, Recreation, and Natural Resources. Uh, she was not able to be here with us today, but she sent some slides along. And this is a program that was started in 1973. There were seven referenda that allowed, to, um, allowed for park land acquisition and protected 69,900 acres of land here in Sarasota County. This is 14% of our county land is protected by these referenda alone, but that doesn't include other conservation lands like state parks and state forests. So actually about a third of Sarasota County is protected conservation land. And so there are five environmental criteria that they consider when they choose these lands to purchase and protect. So rarity, connectedness, quality, water resources, and manageability. So that's all the stuff we just saw towards the end of that video. Can we manage the land? Um, so these five things are the major criteria, but there are a number of other um, attributes. There are 12 attributes that are also considered when they review lands up for acquisition to decide whether or not they will become part of the Environmentally Sensitive Lands Protection Program, or ESLEP. These are the habitat types that, that are priority types to conserve, so many of the things that we have talked about during our time together today. Here is a map of some of those natural area parks in and around Englewood. So the green are the more natural area, the blue are the beach parks, uh, the orange is athletic facilities. So there's a number even right around the Englewood area. Ang Anger Tr Creek Trails is one of these protected lands. So we're just going to look at these really quick. This was protected in 2004 and 2006 by the ESLEP program. It's 145 acres of pine flatwoods, music hammock, and riverine habitat. Here's Manasota Scrub, which was the first place we visited in the video. Uh, it's one of my favorite preserves. There's wetland areas, which is where we went at the beginning of the video on the east side of Bridge Road. And then there's more scrub habitat and flatwoods on the west side of Bridge Road. So really unique. Englewood Sports Complex was also purchased. And of course there are athletic facilities here, but you can see a signature of a wetland pond, right or a wetland uh, depressional marsh right there. Line Pass Beach, 72 acres, and there's beach dune, beach dune coastal hammock and mangrove fringe and forest there. And Minnesota Beach is also part of the SLEP program, 23 acres that was acquired in the early 1970s, and native habitat consists of beach dune, coastal hammock, and mangrove fringe and forest also. 
Here is Bree's information. Uh, you can contact her or you can go to land nominations at scgov.net if you have land that you are interested in uh, conserving or even donating to this program or if you want to put land up that you think is important enough uh, to be purchased for conservation by this program. There's a whole process for that. So you would contact Bree or just our Sarasota County government. So at the end here, what can you do to help? Well, we want these lands to be around for future generations to come. We want it to be around for our wildlife and for the plants that make Florida their home. So we wanna support our county and state parks and you can support them. Of course, you know, I support them financially but you can also support them by just utilizing them and going out and enjoying them and connecting to the nature that we have here in Sarasota County. Support land conservation efforts through, there's a variety of foundations, including our SLEP program that I just talked about. And we wanna support wildlife habitat and connectivity. So part of the reason for restoration is that some of those areas like the spoil area is not going to be utilized by wildlife and the native plants are not going to be able to live there. So we want to not only restore these areas but we want to conserve areas that have that natural habitat and then connect them. We need to be thinking about things on a landscape level not just a very local neighborhood level which is important, but also how do we connect these different pieces so some of our larger wildlife can continue to live and traverse through our area. So get involved locally, go out and enjoy, whether it's by land or by sea, go out and enjoy these areas, connect yourself to the land and then connect with something that you care about and support those efforts. Learn more and share everything that you're excited about with others. We have lots of classes through UF IFAS Sarasota County Extension. Most of them are free. There is a University of Florida program called the Florida Master Naturalist Program that I mentioned at the beginning. There is a cost to that program, but they have a variety of courses that are specifically about the ecology of our wonderful state. And just get excited, get excited about something you love, connect with a group, um, whether that's, you know, that could be us, it could be Audubon, it could be um, Conservation Foundation, it could be um, the Sierra Club. I mean, there's so many different organizations out there working to save our environment. And so just connect with people that are like-minded about things you care about, and that will make a difference in and of itself. 